Geltman and Weld on the Hammer Factor. Take it away, boys. All right. Welcome to episode number 54 of the Hammer Factor. My name is John Grace, show producer, and I'd like to introduce my co-host, former North Fork champ and policy director for the Outdoor Alliance, Lewis Geltman, whitewater legend, owner of IR, John Weld. What's up, fellas? Co-owner. Co-owner of of Emergency. Grace, turn your video on. You guys can't see me? Nah. That's a hard negative. Stand by. Oh, there we go. Now am I coming through? Yeah. Oh. All right, so what's been going on? Can I ask you a question, John Grace? Sure, what you got? It, is Asheville a mountain town? Yeah, I'd say it is. You know, and what's the mountain? Mount Pisgah. Because a lot of these... Clothing companies are like referring to like clothing that's perfect for the mountain town, like mountain town shirts, and mountain town jackets. Does that just mean like a plaid a, shirt? Yeah, but I'm trying to figure out what they mean by a mountain town. I think they're are they specifically referring to like Telluride? Is that exactly what they're talking about, or is there a broader <laughs> reach to that? I, I don't know. But before we get into this, this episode yeah. is sponsored by CKS Online www.coloradokayak.com. CKS Online is a business that is under separate ownership from CKS Main Street, home of hammerhead extraordinaire Fred Morrison. CKS Online is also not located in Buena Vista, Colorado, home of the BV Boogie Board and SUP River Park and the paddler formerly known as Earl. CKS Online is, however, located in Salida, Colorado, and an e-commerce paddle sports retailer with a warehouse pickup option. We're here to serve all of your paddle sports needs, ranging from drain plugs, wing nuts, and cam straps, to rafts, sups, whitewater boats, and everything in between. Use promo code, all caps here, WELD STILL SUPS, that's mm. all caps, Weld still sups for 10% off your next purchase with CKS online. I did not sign off on that coupon code, by the way. <laughs> but can it's... I say something about CKS uh, online, though? They are a whitewater store. That's their focus, is whitewater. Undoubtedly. Right? I, I mean, how many stores are left like that? Not many. Not you have many. to give them credit. No, definitely give I think them credit. That's awesome. Always, always been a fan of those guys. Worked with those guys several times throughout the years, and want to say a big thank you to them for sponsoring episode fifty-four of the show. Have you guys been to Salida lately? Has Salida gotten all bougie yet? I have not been there. I was there a couple of years ago. I don't know. It didn't seem too different from when years passed. Salida is a mountain hair. town, right? Unquestionably. I think so. Is Hood River a mountain town? Mm, that's a good question. I mean, you got Mount Hood. I guess that's your mountain there. They I definitely call have, it. They have an attitude of a mountain town. What do you yeah. think, Lewis? You live there. I would not describe it as a mountain town, but it has some mountain town like attributes. Like a lot of people with too much time and money on their hands and lots of breweries. Mm. Hmm. Interesting. So. You guys went to OR, outdoor retailer. We did. We missed you there. And I did not, which was unusual. Felt weird. Usually the IR booth is like my uh, my place of sanctuary where I can escape talking to people. And you and I just sort of stare catatonically in between conversations <laughs> about like the New Yorker or whatever we can think of to talk about that has nothing to do with equipment or public lands. Right. Like 15,000 word articles on like Margaret Thatcher's policies <laughs> towards <laughs> Eastern Europe in the late 80s. <laughs> so. What did you think of the show, Lewis? I don't know. I somehow managed to not form any sort of coherent feelings about it. I, Denver was more pleasant than I recollected. I feel like that light rail made a big difference in getting in from the airport. That's new, I think. Like I, I feel like all of my complaints about Denver are just so boring and inside baseball. It's just sort of like uh, the airport's too far away and it's the size of metropolitan Portland. And it's just everything's in pain, but I don't know. It was fine. It seemed like there were a lot of people there. 
there's a Chipotle within walking distance of the trade show. That was nice. Just to keep, get people up to speed on this, uh, I know we've talked about this before, but uh, paddle sports as an industry left outdoor retailer. You know, the outdoor retailer show represents the outdoor industry, at least ostensibly. Paddle sports up and left two years ago, uh, officially, started their own show. So a lot of us paddle sports manufacturers don't go there. And it was a controversial move. Many people, including myself, felt like we should have stayed at the one trade show and not burdened retailers with going to two different trade shows and whatnot. But lo and behold, we did. But there still were paddling companies there, right? I mean, who was still there from paddle sports? There were, I believe, 10. I have a list here. I think I have it. This is who was there. Um, Confluence, Hobie, mm. Kokatat, Bic, Pelican, Emotion, Hala, Soul, uh, and Scotty, and NRS. And that's it. I mean, it really says something that like three quarters of those are brands that I have no, I like, guess <laughs> nothing to do with what we do. <laughs> right, exactly. But I mean, I mean like paddle sports paddle- in general, that was it. I mean, were there a strong presence? Was it like business as usual? Did like, Confluence still have its palatial 60 by 60 square foot booth or what was, what was, what was going on there? They had the big booth, but it was not the same. There was, there were not, I saw, I saw Fred, I saw a few guys from a few retailers, but I saw virtually no paddle sport retailers there. And I don't know how many were there. I'm sure there were there that weren't, you know, and my takeaway is that they're moving this show all the way up to June. I don't know how, a paddle sport shop can in the middle of June when they're still sitting on half of their inventory and it's like prime time, the season's pretty much just started pick up and go to a trade show and start thinking about buying this stuff for next year. I so, mean, as a manufacturer, I have to make, I made 2019 gear last January. What do you think I knew about the upcoming season? <laughs> <laughs> I mean, how, is the, how, is the, how, how come we have to hold all this <laughs> on our shoulders? Well, I'm right? just, I, but I'm just and saying, not, not only that, not only that, every single retailer in this country, it, it, there's no paddle sports retailer growing by 300% a year right now, at least not in paddle sports. They're growing at 5% if they're growing at all. They know exactly what they're going to sell next year. And it, it, if, they, if they have even a, a copy of Excel on their computer, they're keeping track of what they sold and they know what they're going to do. And they can they can plan ahead and they should be planning ahead. They should be working with manufacturers to, uh, uh, to make sure that we're all together on this uh, as one team, you know. Yeah. Now, uh, now then moving the power we're showing to September is not helping anybody, but I mean, it's not helping manufacturers. That's for sure. Now, having said that it was, I, I really did feel, feel like a big part of the show was missing without the paddle sports guys there. So yeah. it was kind of a catch 22 for me. I'm, you know, I'm trying to understand it. I'm trying to support the cause, but at the same time, I'm like, man, we are part of this industry. Like everybody was there. The, the, they were our people. So, I know. I, I know. Don't get me started. Let's move on. I don't want to talk about this anymore. It's just, it's just, it did feel like good energy though. Like, I mean, it was packed. Like it wasn't, uh, it just makes me mad that we're not there. You know, it seems silly. It, it, it was packed. And you know, I got, you know, there's some things I know that like it costs $800 to crack a keg of beer at that show. If that's your booth. And there's some like monetary things that, are way too inside baseball for this show, but they put on a good <clears throat> job with that show. I mean, when you right when you got off the airport, they were directing directing you to that rail that Lewis was taking. About nine bucks takes you all the way from the airport, thirty minutes, pretty much to the actual trade show. They had rickshaws that you could ride within a mile or two of the place for free. They anybody who came to the show had a bike share that they could use for free the entire time we were there. I mean, it was. I, I thought it was put on well, and I had a good time. So it's a it's a mountain town, Denver. <laughs> Actually, I don't know. Denver is Boulder is a mountain town, but the paddle sports show we're going to in a month Boulder is, is not a Oklahoma, mountain town. Oklahoma, Oklahoma City, which is the definition of not a mountain town. <laughs> yeah, you're right. <laughs> you're right. That's Frack Central. <laughs> right. I mean, uh, all right. Anyway, anyway, enough you guys with will that. Be back eventually. <laughs> I know that's what pisses me off. We're gonna be back, and the people who were forced, you know, IR, who was forced to leave, is gonna be at the back of the line to get booth space. You know, we had 20 years of seniority built up at Salt Lake City. We had a great, we had great real estate, and that's all thrown out the window now. Anyway, anyway, we digress. Any, we certainly do. We have a 
we have a stacked show notes page here and uh i know it's been like three months i feel like we had a very long summer break let's get right into lewis here who is mike lee and when can we claim our land uh sigh um Mike Lee is junior senator from Utah. Uh, He has been one of the more outspoken shitheads in Congress on public lands policy. And he gave a speech, I don't know, three or four weeks ago now, a speech slash Twitter rant in which he announced his intention to introduce three bills. The first one was going to end the applicability of the Antiquities Act in Utah. So no more national monuments, no fixing this debacle that Trump has uh, rolled us into with Bears Ears and Grand Staircase Escalante. The second bill is going to create what he calls a new Homestead Act, but which is really about just allowing private industry to lay claim to public lands. And the third one is an outright transfer of public lands to the states. And this speech that he wrote, it was actually like, it's very well done. He like created this, this narrative about uh, sort of comparing federal ownership of public lands to like royal lands in the UK, which to me, it seems like a, a very historically dubious construction, but it, it had some narrative force behind it. And he's sort of like, well, you know, why do these fat cats in Washington, D.C. decide what the people do with their land? And we're going to free ourselves and we're going to, you know, turn the public lands over to the states. And it's like it, it was it's sort of compelling in a way. But like the thing about it is when you start picking at what he's talking about, you know, transferring, you know, BLM land, national forests, basically everything that's not a national park to the states, you know, the details of that transaction, things just fall apart immediately. It's like, you know, he's talking about national public lands as if they're these burdens on the states. And he's talking about how Utah is at such a disadvantage compared to like, I think he, his examples were like Missouri and Indiana or something like that. (laughs) And, you know, as somebody who lives in a public land state, like I, I can assure you that I do not want where I live to look like, you know, the, the landscape in Missouri and, Indiana. It's like I do not view the public lands that are around the place where I live as anything other than a, a unalloyed benefit. Like that's why we're here, right? It's like you know to be able to go, go ski, go paddle, go ride your bike, like out on the public lands and these like big open spaces and wild landscapes. And you know what what Mike Lee is the world are after is just unmitigated development and it's like you know i think like something like a new homestead act it's like it sounds great if you're like oh yeah i'm gonna go out and like stake my claim and i'm gonna you know get this free land and i mean it's great in a way if you imagine that you're actually going to be the beneficiary of that policy but i assure you that you are not it's like (laughs) unless you're the ceo of halliburton or something this isn't for you and And I mean, you just like, I don't know, you like go somewhere like, like, I don't know, you get on a bend and run like Meadow Camp. And I don't know what the the development deal is down there, but it's like the whole run is just lined with like these housing developments that are overlooking the river. And it's like, it it just detracts, you know, it's like, I guess if you own one of those houses, it's probably nice to have that view and be able to walk down to the river. But for everybody else, it's just like an eyesore. (laughs) well i agree with you in the in the whole narrative because i read it and i was like oh this is great like i walked in the room i was like chelsea we're packing up the van and we are gonna go claim some land you know it just sounded like so cool yeah i i I have a strong premonition that it's it's not gonna play out that way um Uh, but then you're right. You start peeling back the layers and you're like, this is probably the most ridiculous thing I've, and, and I mean, this guy is like an actual Senator for the state of Utah, right? Oh yeah. He's the, yeah. I mean, and so here's like a little inside baseball on it is, you know, like these guys, you know, there's been like a fringe element in the West that's been talking about transferring the public lands to the States forever. And it, you know, sometimes it bubbles up a little hotter than other times. And you know, it had been pretty bad a couple of years ago and it seemed like things had quieted down a little bit or that some of these threats to actually wholesale transfer public lands had evolved into sort of a more nuanced threat where, uh, 
you know, the states would be given more management responsibilities over the national public lands, which is, you know, equally, if not more problematic in a lot of ways. But, you know, like when somebody like Lee comes out and says, you know, we're just going to turn over the public lands and we're going to privatize as much as we can. We're going to get rid of this stuff. It's like, it gives away the game in a way. It's like, it's great for us because it, it helps everyone out there understand what these guys are really all about, which is privatizing public land. So, you know, when you see these bills like the Energy Independence Act or whatever it was, you know, whatever some of these bills are called, where they're talking about, you know, turning over energy development decisions to the states, you, you know, see very clearly this is all part of the same agenda, which is privatization of public resources. So, you know, I don't know. Nice we've <clears throat> what was that, what, John? It's good branding. The, the homestead stuff. Yeah, I mean, no, like the in energy independence. I think that's a message we can all get behind. It's good marketing, Lewis. If 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 someone wants to, what, what's our what's our action plan here? If someone is for this plan or against it, how do they voice their opinion? Uh, OutdoorAlliance.org. Check it out. We got a blog post up. There's a petition going on right now. And oh yeah, where I was going with this a minute ago was that, you know. We've heard these ideas a million times. I, it's where you know we don't want to. I don't want to understate the importance of kind of beating this stuff back. But it was sort of we were sort of shrugging our shoulders, just like ah, uh, you know, like another extremist senator doing this. But what we've been hearing is that you know Rob Bishop, who's a uh, uh, House member from Utah, who's the chair of the House Natural Resources Committee, he's been sort of the leading voice in the Utah congressional delegation on public lands and has been kind of. I, you know, I think historically Utah has always had sort of one person in their congressional delegation who's been kind of the leader of the mob on public lands issues and, you know, generally speaking, not to good effect. And Bishop is going to retire after this next uh, this next term because he's term limited out from the chairmanship of the House Natural Resources Committee. And that's all he really wants to do is work on public lands issues. So this is about Mike Lee trying to position himself as the leader of the congressional delegation on public lands issues. And it seems as if he is sort of angling to eventually become the chair of the Senate Energy and Natural Resources Committee, which is the kind of roughly the Senate analog to the Natural Resources Committee in the House. And so, you know, that would be an unmitigated disaster because he is, you know, very, very extreme in his views and his interest in attacking public lands and you know the chair of the energy and natural resources committee is maybe the most important person in congress on public lands issues so it's really important that you know his senate colleagues hear from their constituents that they are not on board with Mike Lee's agenda for public lands and we do not want this dude gaining any traction with his colleagues we do not want to see him become chair of ENR down the road so, you know, reaching out to your lawmakers, as far-fetched as some of these ideas sound, just reaching out to them and saying, hey, here, we're hearing the stuff that Mike Lee is saying, and we're not on board with this. Like, that's that's important in the long run. There you go. Go to OutdoorAlliance.org. That is just, like, almost, that's kind of frightening, you know, just how calculated that is, like, down-the-road plan that's going on here. Whew. All right. Before we get into... Uh, a couple other topics of conversation. Lewis, while we're at it, we have we got some great listener mail. We got our we're gonna do our five and thirty seconds, the whole nine yards, but I got a couple here before we get into some other topics. Lewis, this one comes at us from Dieter Backwinkle. I think I said that right, Backwinkle. He says, uh, good afternoon. Lewis has mentioned a couple times that the laws regarding mining in the U.S. are way outdated. I've been looking into mining laws specifically and making mining claims on public land. It seems the gist of it is just find an area that no one else has a claim on, prove there's a certain mineral there, and put in an application for a claim. I know it's more complex than that, but in theory, based on these archaic laws, couldn't someone start a bullshit mining company and file mining claims on public land just to prevent other mining companies from laying claims to these lands? Would be pretty cool if so. Just my random thought of the day. And he's got a link on here that we'll include in the show, mo show notes. Is this, a, is this a plan of action, Lewis? Um, I, I like where his head's at. Yeah, so um, what he's saying, you know, just to be real clear, he's saying, hey, can we go out and make these claims and hold up this land to act as a, st you know, a stop to actual mining claims being put in by mining companies? Yeah, um, 
not really uh you basically have to be sort of at some pace actually pursuing mining on the claim like you have to be doing some exploratory work you have to be kind of developing the claim or you lose it so yeah i mean i I see where he's going with that i I guess I, i can't really counsel uh fraudulent fraudulent mining claims but um there, there's a little more to it than that not very much but i don't think that you can sort of like defensively stake a claim with a conservationist agenda but uh well i'm I, going to uh i've also heard about some folks up out in outside colorado like getting mining claims to build like little tiny backcountry ski huts for themselves as part of you know some alleged mining operation that i, I don't know how how that's exactly played out over the years. I, I'm go, I'm going to counsel Dieter to go for it. Maybe get a group, start a nonprofit with 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 this mission statement. I don't I know. I think if you I think if you make it a nonprofit, you're going to give away the game. Mm, maybe but right. I think there are a lot of uh, <laughs> there's, there's not many actually, nonprofit mining companies out there. As I understand it, there are actually a lot of a lot of the actual mining companies have no intention of actually doing the mining. It's like they just do the exploratory work try to sort of prove the viability of a claim and then sell it to some other mining company. And a lot of them are real shady kind of fly by night operations that are basically just in the business of like bilking investors. So, you know, you would probably be in good company if you wanted to engage in some, some dubious mining claims. I don't know. (laughs) I want to, I want to push for a a play boating trick called the backwinkle. (laughs) (laughs) <laughs> we digress Thank- like a, <laughs> what's it look that's like that's a good name right the back- uh, I'm thinking like a McNasty with something like a variation thrown in paddle twirl or something a, a oh you like yeah. you like take your paddle and like just <sighs> smash it into the river at the end of it like to stake your claim <laughs> uh, well thanks for that email Dieter um, I say go for it that's my counsel uh, this next one for you Lewis this comes in from Andy Cornwell He says, what's up, ninjas? As you may know, the winter season was pretty dry, which has now caused a crazy forest fire season here in Colorado. Thanks, Al Gore. So the rivers are already dried up, but the few that are running don't have much camping options around them because the fires shut down the land and prevent us from making campfires. Nothing goes better better with a booty beer than s'mores, so this really puts a damper on the pathetic boating season out here. I'm assuming he's talking about Colorado. So this question may be more for Lewis, but do you all think logging in the National Forest would help prevent or reduce forest fires? How do you feel about logging in BLM land? Two questions there. He says, I know Oregon gets wildfires, wildfires too, and they have thicker forests than Colorado, but... I'd like to know if they have beetle kill there like we do. So what do you guys think is the best way to preemptively control and contain wild, wild, wildfires? And can we make some 193 15-degree offset paddles from the burnt wood? Thanks, Andy. Lewis, I think you're up on this one again. Well, to take the last question first, I think any 193 15-degree offset paddle is a desecration of our public (laughs) lands. And so if you're going to do that, it needs to be at least 245-degree offset. Well played. Mm -hmm. Um, Thank you. So would logging help with – so I I think part of the reason that we're having so many problems with fires aside from climate change is this – you know, legacy of fire suppression where you know, like on the, like for us here in the, in the Cascades, you know, the West side uh, forests are quite different from the East side of the Cascades where it's much drier on the West side, you know, there's meant to be like a 150 to 300 or 400 year fire cycle. And so these massive fires that are to the West of the Cascades, like that Eagle Creek fire that we had out here last summer, you know, it was human cause, which was, sad and unfortunate but it was uh you know relatively you know potentially ecologically beneficial in the long run and sort of occurred on a timing that was in keeping with the normal fire cycle on the east side forests the fire cycle is meant to be like you know naturally much shorter like it's like something like 15 years and it's like where these big ponderosa forests and when they uh 
you know, when there's a long time period of fire suppression, like kind of the underbrush grows up. And so that when there is a fire, it becomes much more severe and burns the existing trees. And like what really needs to happen is fire needs to come through that landscape much more often. Um, and kind of keep all of the, uh, the smaller growth down that helps, you know, reduce the severity of the fires when they do happen. So sort of to bring things back into normal balance, it's like what needs to happen is there does need to be some, um, uh, you know, like some like remedial logging or, um, you know, like restoration forestry activities going on and then bring it back, bring the landscape back into a place where it can kind of exist in a normal fire cycle. And I know that's more how it works out here. So I think it's sort of more about like from an ecological perspective, it's more about uh, restoring things to kind of their like natural state and then fire can have its more natural role in the landscape. And so I, you know, I, I think logging on public lands is sort of a separate issue than you know, fire management. It's like, I don't think that it's like a situation where it's like, Oh, we need to like cut these forests down and then we won't have this forest fire problem anymore. Um, you know, there is a place for logging on public lands that that was the original purpose of the national forests. And you now wood is a sustainable building material. It's good to have, you know, I mean, forestry makes sense in the right context. So I, and I, I think sometimes what we're seeing from a policy standpoint is there's an effort to push through more logging activity kind of under the guise of addressing fire. And I think those are two things that should really be addressed separately. Gotcha. One note here is that he talks about the beetle kill. And I know that trees that do die like that, they have one year to log them before the wood is pretty much unusable to the logging companies. So there's a point to where the profit thing doesn't work out of clearing forests with beetle kills. I don't know. That's a tough one. I think that's a good answer. Sure. Yeah. Yeah. I mean, it's, it's complicated. I mean, it's complicated. Before we get into our five questions in 30 seconds, have you guys heard of the new kayak company, Vagabond Kayaks? As of about I an hour have. before I go. <laughs> it's, uh, I know because this, they're ordering backhands from us, but it started by that Sellers character who started uh, Fluid or Fluid Kayaks. Right. Does, does that no longer exist? I don't think so. He's a good guy. I'm not, I, I care who does, who, who works with him closely on the backband stuff would know more about it than I do, but I don't think, they, I don't think Fluid's still around. Um, but he's back at it again. I, I'm not, I'm not sure what if you got out of kayaking. I'm not sure what would pre, you know pro, you know make you want to get back into it. But lo and behold, here he is. <laughs> well, I went to his website. He does have this whitewater boat that looks pretty good, um, but he's got a whole other line of boats. And I mean, if he's buying back bands and looking to get into retailers, I mean, it looks like there's another whitewater company. It looks like he's going the retail route, man. That's a, for a company, a small company like that, that's a tough. That's a tough road, man. I'm looking at what Evan's doing with Waka, and that it's a small business, but it makes the way Evan does it is makes some degree of sense for a small business like that. It's going to hamper growth, but it's I think it's a lot more sustainable than going the retail route when you're that teeny, you know. I can say every time I see one of these new kayak kayak companies, I'm always sort of hopeful that like they're going to do something fresh, like like let's have some like innovative construction or like innovative design. And like every time you see, I mean, I don't know anything about it. I mean, maybe they're, that's what they're doing, but I feel like so often what you just see is like another mediocre kayak and it's just like, uh, like, I mean, I, I hope that's not the case here, but it's just like, I, it would be so nice to see somebody blow molding or doing something with composites or designing some like really progressive kayaks. But I mean, do you think what Waka is doing? Do you think they're at the, the top of the game right now in terms of Creek boats or right up there? Design for sure, construction less so. I don't think there's any money. There's not enough money in paddle sports to really do anything crazy with construction. You know, you're just so limited by how much money you're going to make in this enterprise. You know. Yeah, I guess it's more just like like if you're doing it, like are you doing it just because you want to 
live that John Weld lifestyle. I mean, it is appealing that, <laughs> you know, it's like just to do it. It's like, don't do it just to do it. Do it to do something better than what's out there right now. Right. Well, I will say if you're going to enter the whitewater market, you better enter with the mentality is I'm going to disrupt this thing because if you're just going to go in and copy the designs out there and uh, I'm not sure how that's going to work for you. I don't know. Boat looks pretty good though. I mean, he's got some cool little designs on there and some sit on tops. None of these things I, from what looks like it was one side. None of these things are made. It just looks like some kind of CAD drawings, but I don't know. Sell yeah. yours. If you're out there, send me an email. I'll, I'll, I'll update everybody what you got going on. Yeah. Did I tell you I got to paddle the soul boats? I went up to, uh, or a couple no. of them. No. no. We don't know. a whole bunch of new boats since we were last together. I have two, as a matter of fact. That's a crazy, it's, a, it's been a crazy couple of months here in Confluence. I, pi- I finally paddled the Ripper, and I also... And? Okay, okay, okay. Let's kind of it's... like hold off with our original plan here, and let's get into these boats. So, yeah. so Lewis, you, you did the Ripper. Yeah, I just took it down our, our Class 3 summer run out here. Um it was cool. It did some good things. It was like a lot snappier and kind of smoother on the stern than the wrap was. Like I felt like you could, you know, keep the stern under and do like a nice imaginary upstream. Mm-hmm. Um, felt pretty snappy on a wave. I, I thought it was pretty sweet, but the one thing is it's like, it's so out of balance. Like when you make a boat when the bow is too much bigger than the stern, it just starts doing like really weird things. Like anytime you put the boat on edge, like on the inside edge, the stern drops. So like when you go to do a peel out, not even trying to do a pivot turn, the bow just comes up. Cause like, as soon as you put it on edge, you know, there's so much more surface area on the chine and the deck in the bow than there is in the stern and the bow comes up. So like, you know, you just going downstream, like kind of trying to carve turns and you, lean to the inside and the bow comes up you like go to run spirit and you know, like for me like running the running spirit and the brap you can't like do that big dramatic edge like you know everybody wants to do these days if you do that in a boat with a really small stern you just you know boot the dicks out of it pop a willy <laughs> <laughs> and so it's like if i if i could take that ripper and change anything i think what i would want to do is just raise the back deck like a half inch or so just for like the foot or so right behind the cockpit and like lower the deck where your knees are in the bow and i know that that sort of would just make the boat feel smaller but i think it would cut down on the the weirdness a little bit what size did you paddle medium yeah and do you feel good about that size What's that? Did you feel good about that size? Yeah, it was good. Would you go, if you had to paddle one boat for the next year, Party Brap or Ripper? Ripper. I, the Party Brap's too small. All right. There you go. What else? You paddled these soul boats? Yeah, I went up to, uh, to Skooks, um, and I was up there with Benny Mar, and he had uh, like a whole massive quiver of boats up there just for surfing skook and uh but the best boat i paddled was like hands down this surf kayak called the mini mako just made for ocean surfing and it was so fun on the wave when it was green just like non-stop grinning um and then i tried corn's boats the uh the 303 which is that longer lower volume boat it sort of looks like a slalom boat it also has some flavors of like a perception saber, I would say. Right. Um, <laughs> that was not very good, and I paddled. Uh, you I think it's called the. You weren't a fan of that one. It, it, something about the edge on the boat would just like lock in on the wave in a way that was kind of awkward. I, I don't know. It just it didn't really sing for me. And then uh, I think I tried this like playboat thing called the porn star. Um, (laughs) I I was like, how was the porn star? (laughs) (laughs) Um, you know, we were mainly surfing the wave when it was green and I'm not much of a playboater and Benny like does not outfit his boats at all, which is just like, it it makes all the things that he does like that much more mind blowing when it's like, (laughs) But it's like watching somebody ski with like their boot buckles undone and like ski boots that are like four sizes too big and still shredding harder than you can 
even imagine is possible you know <laughs> it's like that much more impressive that i cannot do that and just paddling these like unoutfitted boats my ability to form an impression was a little constrained i would say but i don't know the construction was a little weird like you could definitely tell looking at them that they were you know they were making them as one-offs like i remember i know corin didn't want to divulge any of his production secrets when we had them on before but you know you can tell just looking at them that they weren't made out of a mold it's like they must they're probably like cnc'ing foam blocks or something like that and laying up on the outside and so like you can see where the the uh the fabric was like bridging over you know like the recesses for the grab loops and things like that and oh, weird. I, you could just stop looking at it that they were they were built as one-offs so like the constructions i mean i don't know i mean i guess if that's what you have to do to be able to make custom boats at a reasonable price then you know i'm sure it's worth it but i wasn't super impressed what about you john what have you paddled I paddled the Brap and the Ripper back to back, sort of a paddle off on the upper golly or upper, upper yak. Uh, and I, I'm torn, man. It's a very tough decision, but I don't know. So definitively, yeah. which one is better? I, well, I, I'll tell you, I'm still, I still have my party Brap. Okay. Okay. Well, but, I, I got to paddle the new Piranha longboat. Ooh. Yeah. And, uh, oh, really? Yep. It's it, like the 12R or whatever. <laughs> the, the 12R. Yep. It was interesting. Yeah. It was, uh, it's still a prototype. So it's not what's actually going to be released. But it was definitely different than the other three longboats on the market. It had some, like, some cool things where, like, you know how, like, in a longboat, especially like, like, kind of modern longboats, a lot, a lot of the times, like, you'll reach your paddle down and you'll hit the side of your boat. You know, like when you're when you're when you're putting your paddle in for your catch. Has that ever happened to you guys? Mm-hmm. You like clank off the side yeah. of the boat. This has got yeah. like some some divots carved in right there, which I thought was kind of a cool feature. That sounds like, like a somewhere... solving a problem no one really has. <laughs> Not seriously. <laughs> Take a more vertical oh. stroke. <laughs> somewhere oh, for your before for, before before I forget, I paddle the home slice in a session session plus back to back also. Oh, how was that? Uh, in my opinion, Session Plus wins hands down. <laughs> That's so funny. Listen, the, the, it's a lot more uncomfortable. There's no question about that, but it's a lot more fun than the than the home slice. The session Damn. Session Plus was a good boat, man. I mean, you couldn't sit in. At least I couldn't sit in it for more than thirty yeah. minutes. But god dang, it yeah. was a fun boat. Yeah, it's the best cartwheeling boat ever made. Yeah, I agree with that. Um, all right, back on point here. We are so far behind time. If you can see Dude. these show notes, I don't even know what to say. We're going to have to cut something. But what I want to get into here, this comes, this email comes in. I'm, going to, I'm just going to sum it up from John Trimbley. And this is going to lead us into, we're going to do a whole show on squirt boating. But basically, he sort of lays down the pro- uh, progression of mystery move times and basically what's happened over the last 10 years. These guys get together at the World Mystery Move Championships. It was held July 7th on the Santiam River. That's near you, Lewis. You ever you ever go down there and squirt? Uh, no, but it's been really hot, and I was just thinking yesterday about hitting up Will Pruitt, who's got a couple squirt boats out here, and seeing if he would take me out. So anyway, just to the mission here, both Taps, Taff Sibley and Jeremy Pugh, uh, Jeremy Pooh, Pugh or Pooh? Pooh Pooh? I don't oh. know. Um, but anyway, they both clocked uh, mystery moves longer than sixty seconds. So I was at a party. I was at a party like a week ago, and I, I talked with Jim Snyder about this this exact thing for like an hour. You know, it was a very, it was very. You know, listen. I don't know if you've ever talked to Jim Snyder. He's a very interesting dude. Um, but he was, you know, he was deeply, deeply informed on this. <laughs> so I mean, I'm under the, I'm under the impression uh, uh, uh. that. I'm under the impression that it's just a matter of how long can you hold your breath, right? I mean, and holding your breath for a minute isn't that hard. But I, I guess he he was explaining that the, the the that where this happened, the the venue for this event, he called it a lethal, potentially lethal uh, place. Like you could go down longer than you want to, and you could drown. Um, and basically, at 60 seconds or so, people are pretty much at the point where they're like, uh, "I got to get out." They they kind of pulled up they pulled a cord. 
So that was kind of my overall take on the situation. Well, big congrats to Jeremy for winning the uh, the championship. He's the 2018 world champion. Uh, the squirt thing, I've taken a squirt boat down the golly. That's the only time I've ever been in a squirt boat. And it was a blast. I had a really good time. But one thing I'll say about this squirt, the downtime, uh, what's it called? The World Mystery Move Championships. Is It's probably the most or one of the most legitimate world championships in paddle sports. They change venues every year. Everybody gets together. They do this whole thing without any sponsorship. I mean, I just got to give these guys a shout out and a big, like, I'm going to give them like an early show rave because they're going to a different location. They're doing their thing. They're having a competition. They're pushing the bar. I mean, I don't know if it'll ever turn into anything, but that's what I thought was cool about it. It just seems like an inherently non-competitive activity to me. You know? Like, I think it's cool, but, like, like, I do. Like, I think it's cool. But, like, I just, like, the idea of, I don't know, sort of like John was saying, like, it seems like if, if that was what you really wanted to do, you would just make your keep making your boat smaller and, like, paddle out there with a cinder block in your lap and go sit on the bottom of the river. <laughs> like, you're like... I, it's like, my understanding these guys are doing, like, they're doing, like, uh, you know, the what the... the the free divers do like in terms of hypoxic work and training themselves to hold their breath for longer periods of time. I believe it. So anyway, I don't know. We need more information on this for sure. I, I'm still, I still have questions. Well, thanks for the email, Mr. Trembley. I think that's a good one. And we have a piece of unfinished business that we have to get into. We've got this dry top that needs to be given away. So this is for the Zinky Sup shirts, which we got some more Zinky Sup, Sup shirts in, which is cool, but they're all gone. So <laughs> you'll have to wait till the next time we get some in. But anyway, w- Andrew Miller has decided, hey, he wants to give the dry top away. He wants to do a donation pool where you get entered into a drawing to win the dry top of your choice, men's or wom- women's, if you donate. All proceeds go to the Outdoor Alliance. One of his kind of caveats is we put the Zinky Sup stitch on the side. I'm totally fine with that, you guys. But, I mean, it seems like – how does that happen? How do you put a patch on well, the he side? Well, he's telling me to send me a patch. I'd sew it on and seam tape it on the inside. I, I mean, I personally wouldn't want to punch a bunch of holes in a perfectly dry top. But if someone really wanted a Zinky Sup's patch on their dry top, we could certainly do it if Andrew's willing to make one. What What do you so. think? What do you think, Lewis? I'm mm, honored that – Andrew wants to do that and donate the money to Outdoor Alliance. Let's let's do it. Okay, so I'll figure out the details on that. Somebody make an make a donation to Outdoor Alliance, and you could walk away with a new dry top. And I guess I feel like we should probably put some parameters on this before we make this happen. Like let's like let's like set some dates and be like make a donation to Outdoor Alliance. I assume we send you a receipt for that, like send a copy of your receipt to us and then we'll do the drawing at some date. We should, we should think this through a little. Well, the logistics of it, we'll figure out, but I mean, I think that's a legit way to give it away. You guys down? Let's do it. Yeah, sure. All right. That's in. All right. Five questions in 30 seconds. Who is up? It's my turn to answer. I don't know whose turn it is to ask grace. Well, who Uh, asked last time? Or Geltman? I think Lewis asked last time. No, I think you asked Lewis last time, John. All right. I want to talk about some of these, though. All right. Well, let me give you my answers. Don't step on my... All right, all right, all right. All right. I so, see you here. So right. since you <laughs> since you want to talk about them, Lewis, so let me, let me I'll, get loosened up here. I'll go ahead and do the five questions. Let me get my timer. Hold on. Hold on. All right. <clears throat> because this is important. You know, these are questions. We get a ton of emails, and we try and get five that could be answered shortly. And some of these these people wanted were asking for a longer answer, but they're not going to get one. They're going to get a short answer because that's all we have time for. But so. you are getting a definitive answer. That's the, that's the I would say thing. so, 100. percent Also, if you want to get your email on Hammer Factor or increase your chance of getting your email read on Hammer Factor, make it short. You know, get it to the point. We don't. I don't need to know. None of us need to want to wade through your entire life history of kayaking. Or be really funny. Or be really funny. That helps too. <laughs> right. All right. Here we go. Okay. Yeah. 30 seconds. All right. Preston wants to know the best cross training sport for kayaking. He's into climbing. What should he do? Swimming. 
open water swimming if you have a good lake. Okay. Um, Cam wants to know your favorite rapid name or names. Uh, Ignorant on Drake's Run is one of my favorites. Uh, I do have two names. Of, I have, well, it's kind of the same name I, I, I'm in my quiver when I get to name a rapid. Uh, one would be uh, Final Arrangements or uh, Getting Your Affairs in Order. Um, that would be the names I have set aside. If people want to use them, go ahead. Okay. But make it a good one. Okay. All right. Carl Whip writes in, he wonders on why the Southeast gets no love compared to Cali. He's, his letter was like, uh, the Southeast boaters all go out to Cali and make videos, but there's no West Coast paddlers coming out East and making videos of the Southeast. And it's simple. I think, and I'm just, I'm about to become a West Coast paddler, so I'll have more insight into this here in a few weeks. But I think West Coast paddlers think Southeast paddling is for like club boaters and families. <laughs> and that kind of thing. It's not like adventure. You know, you go out and t- take your girlfriend down the green and, and uh, sit on top. That kind of a thing. Okay. I'm, I'm, I'm itching to jump in on this. Uh, uh, hang on. Okay. <laughs> Casey yeah. Tango wants to hear the last time you swam. It was on Great Falls with Eric Jackson a long time ago, probably 15 years ago. And it was a high water horseshoe falls scared the shit out of me. It was bad. And it falls into my theory that every kayaker has a finite number of swims in their paddling career. And the last five or six are really bad, Mm -hmm. really, really bad. Jeff Banks, he has a long email, actually a really good email that he comes in. But basically the gist of it is uh, he wonders why IR doesn't sublimate. Jeff Banks was asking about, uh, our overstock or, or MOQs of ordering fabrics and why dry suits are so expensive. And he's right. You can sublimate polyester shell fabric. And we have done this before. Our nebula prints were sublimated. And years ago, we did that plaid jacket sublimated. In both those cases, that fabric after sublimation and paying for the dye charge and everything was like $25 a yard or something like that, which, which is really expensive. And, uh, you know, we don't make all of our jackets out of polyester. You have to sublimate polyester fabric. And there's still MOQs with factories and it to be long story short, it doesn't really help the problem at all. Okay. We're going to come in at Lewis, jump in. Uh you're at two minutes. Good try. That's pretty though. good. All right, jump in there, Lewis. Wh- which ones did you want to chime in on? Mm, mainly I wanted to talk about the rapid names, but Okay. I didn't i I'm partial to uh my nerves are shot and I can't take it anymore. That's a good one. Phil so. Coleman named that one on the on the upper black water. That's a good one. Personally, mm-hmm. I like uh, Hammer Factor. <laughs> <laughs> but no one really gets hammered there. It's not particularly difficult rapid. <laughs> I mean, do people get hammered there? Oh, yeah, dude. When the water really? comes up, you're definitely getting throttled. I mean, All right. pretty much okay. one, I also, one out of two times I take a beating when the water's high. What's your least favorite rapid name? Zoom, anything named Zoom Flume. And there's thousands of them on the East Coast. <laughs> <laughs> uh, my least favorite name of a rapid i you know i don't like like the great falls or the nantahala falls or the you know those kind too of too generic names. yeah i'm just like come on but those are those are named those are named like 300 years ago though i mean you can't i think those were all good answers um swimming you guys taking an uh, issue with my swimming is the best cross training um i think I think, yeah, I think swimming is really good. I think he talks a lot about climbing. I think climbing is really good in those situations where you have to climb. I know that I've been on rivers with climbers, and there's certain situations where I'm like, all right, you take care of that and throw me the rope. You but know? that's a skill. That's not a cross training. I remember I used to swim in a master of swim league when I got out of college just, just to stay fit, and there was a point at which I could swim two and a half lengths underwater at the end of that just from doing hypoxic drills, Ooh. right? So that's down, back, and halfway back again. So I think there's some value in there. All right. How about, how about surfing? I feel like that would be a good one. Like in the water, getting your ass kicked a little bit. No, I, I could do it again. That. I'd be a surfer. I can see that. Let's do one more listener mail topic here. We've got some really good ones. Melissa wants to know what happened to the Streamline Ninja project from Steve Fisher. Uh, we've had sev- excellent question. We've had several <laughs> emails come in about that one. Um, Orion Lacroix, he <laughs> loves. Can I give you guys some advice? Is <laughs> anytime you see a kayaker doing anything on Kickstarter, just starter, just run the other direction. <laughs> <laughs> um orion lacroix loves the boomer interview we have we need to get into this uh tony rice asks about the stukesbury corbulic corbulic 
falling out on Dirtbag Diaries. I'm fascinated by this. I have to understand this more. I, I listen to, to that one. One or both these guys in to discuss this. Someone wants to, Rico420 wants to know about me wrestling at Golly Fest, but man, where do we start? All right. This one comes. Wait, wait. Can, it, can, I, can, I talk, can I talk about the wrestling real quick? Yeah. Just real quick. Yeah, yeah, yeah. First okay. of all, there's a lot of wrestlers who, there's a lot of kayakers who wrestled. You being one of them, John Grace. Yep, yep. All right. Well, well let's read, just, let's read the email. Let's read the email. Uh, if you want to talk about it, um, I just talked to Kevin. He says, no worries. He's standing by so we don't have to rush into our special guest, Kevin Colburn. He says, Dear Grace Geltman Weld and Hammer Factor Nation, as I'm sure you know, every year thousands of paddlers gather in West Virginia for one of the most revered sporting events of all time, the Golly Fest Wrestling Circle. I, for one, find it odd that the most visible paddler out there with actual collegiate wrestling experience, John Grace, has yet to partake in this time-honored tradition. It appears I am not alone, as there has been a growing contingent across the south- Southeast who think that John may just not have what it takes to rough and tumble with the young guns anymore. I have per- per- personally witnessed Ben Drew, Ryan McAvoy, and even skinny-ass Dylan McKinney say that they could take John down without a problem. Ben went a little further and said that he may not be Grace's father, but he is his daddy. <laughs> Sincere- <laughs> Sincerely, Rico420. I mean, it's a pretty good email. I mean, I don't, I right? don't, I don't really have much to say. I, what is I it about like you wrestlers guys and have, kayaking? I feel like you guys have gotten soft. It used to be boxing at Golly Fest. Yeah, maybe, maybe so. I think the boxing, did, <laughs> you know, I think, I think somebody forgot the gloves and it moved to wrestling one year. There are a lot of really good. Like we had this conversation with uh, with Drew Eastman and Jared Seiler and Andy McMurray in the past about the idea of having some sort of like all kayaker wrestling tournament because there are a lot of like Tom McEwen, Andrew McEwen. <laughs> can I, I? The other thing about weird about wrestling, and you could Grace, maybe you could explain this to me, is, is that every time I've met a wrestler, they're always all state. They're never just like a <laughs> shitty wrestler. They're like the best wrestler in the country or the best wrestler in the Mideast or they were like college scholarship wrestler. There's never any mediocre wrestlers. What is that? I don't know. Maybe that's just your observation or maybe the ones that were shitty wrestlers just don't bring it up. Maybe it's like the Special Olympics. There's like a thousand. <laughs> oh, God. Every, like a, everybody's like a, very, a winner. <laughs> yeah, it's like a like a very weird homoerotic Special Olympics. <laughs> I can, I can, <laughs> a bunch of dudes are <laughs> I can, <laughs> grabbing each other. <laughs> oh, God. I can assure you I that is not the case. Nails being furiously pecked out right now. <laughs> well, like you were some over kind here. of like a wrestler, weren't you? My, my response to Rico 420 here is I am too old. I have too many kids. I'm too soft. And dude, I wouldn't stand a chance against Dylan McKinney or Ryan McAvoy or Ben Drew. Those guys would break me in half. So I'm out. I know what I'm beat. Unless somebody wants to put some money on it. Um all right. So let's see. This one comes into my personal email, so we gotta talk about this. Most of these come in through HammerFactor.com. That's great. But this one comes in. It says, uh, this came into my personal email. So it says, hey there, guys. I'm a little disturbed about something you said in, I think it was the part two episode. I think it was in the annoying Canadian caller's voice mail about solo boating. He, he's actually from Minnesota. Um, but I could have that wrong. But you all responded very casually about how you do solo boat. Maybe hesitantly inferred that you know it's not a great idea, but you didn't elaborate, and you certainly didn't express the seriousness of it. I know you were speaking your truth, which you can argue, and I see your point. However, now that you've established yourselves as the ultimate authority in all authority in all things paddling, I couldn't help but think about all the kids out there listening, thinking, wow, if these three do it and are okay with it, even if it's a guilty pleasure, I think I've got the green light to do this. And not just kids, but the 20 and 30-something boater dudes that do admire you guys. I know of at least one person that tried it for the first time after hearing your episode. You guys are more than just talk show hosts. We all know your backgrounds and accomplishments in the sport. And I'm pretty certain that most of your listeners look up to you guys tremendously. I know this is about you all speaking the truth. Trust me. I can't get John to not be so honest, and it's terrifying. But I feel like you owe this topic a bit more of a conversation about how dumb it is to run Heartwater alone because it is. 
and she says, oh, and Grace, when are you going to talk more about your T-Dub trips back in the day? You promised, but we never hear it. I want more details on some of those trips. This comes at us from Kara Weld from Immersion Research. Mm. Right. <clears throat> Who wants to grab this one? Lewis, you're kind of sitting back smiling. Um, I have to recuse myself from this one. <laughs> <laughs> Thank you, Lewis. Go ahead. Well, do you sure you don't want to take this one? <laughs> oh, no. <laughs> I mean, uh, she's right, of course. We, you know, it's we're uh, <laughs> subtly advocating a dangerous thing to do. What, what else is? What else can we say about it? I mean. Yeah, I mean, that. yeah, Kara's right. But, I mean, I guess we're sort of going on the assumption in a way that by the time you get to the point where you're thinking about running a hard white water by yourself, you've developed some experience and are aware of those risks. And I think maybe we should not be making that assumption about people because it definitely is dangerous. And I think one of the things that I sort of like about it is that it makes you more acutely aware of those risks, or at least it does for me. I'm sure there are people out there who don't, I don't know. It's like we've talked about people in the past who have just sort of like no innate fear of anything. And I guess there are more people out there like that than we always necessarily let on. But, uh, you know, for me, I think one of the things that I like about Palango myself is like, you do become super aware of the risks and what would happen if something goes wrong. And that sort of brings you into the moment in a way that's kind of compelling. Um, and I think yeah. there's something to be said no, for much. paddling easier whitewater. <laughs> <laughs> you know, like you can paddle easier whitewater by yourself. And well, you Peter know, Peter maybe... Benedict Peter Benedict wrote in also on this subject, and without getting into his email, which was somewhat lengthy, he did mention he did point out things like Jeff West, who paddled his keen by himself and was never seen again. Um, when I think most people would say if he was with somebody, that very well may not have happened. Right. Uh, and like, you know, I'll give you another example. Like out here, like I am pretty comfortable paddling a little white by myself, at least at, you know, relatively mellow levels. But I like almost never will run the trust by myself. And one of the reasons for that is that I feel like Big Brother is a place where if something went wrong, like if you, you know, landed badly off that drop and like if I might hurt my shoulder or something like that and ended up in the cave and I was by myself and swam like you would drown in a situation where having a buddy there with a rope would turn that into something that was not necessarily a very big deal at all and that element where like you know like Wayne has knocked himself unconscious on double drop before and you know, there are a couple of like specific places on that run, despite it being significantly easier than the little white that I feel like have an element of unpredictability to them that makes me not really want to go do it by myself. And so, you know, I think giving some consideration to where you're going, what you're doing, maybe that's part of it. I don't know. Well, Peter Benedict, obviously who is on a, He's he's on a he's on a binge listening kick right now, you know. Like he, he he's kind of like one of the kids who's been like playing World of Warcraft for like thirty six hours straight and hasn't closed their eyes, you know. Like all they're doing is he's drinking. Hamper practice nonstop. He's a deep. Yeah. He's in deep, which which definitely we get you know some some listener mail that talks about that, but you know it, it got to me thinking is like if there is a question. It, it, without a doubt, Kara's right. Without a doubt, it's important. And I think what Peter says is he enjoys paddling by himself, mostly because of logistics or whatnot. But it's also important to mention, just like you did, Lewis, and like he does about Jeff West passing away and how Lane knocked himself out. Those situations are worse when you're on your own. And I, I personally, I think that you have to answer honestly. But... I don't know. It's a tricky one. You know, it's like kayaking is inherently dangerous. A lot of it is, especially when you start getting to the class five level, you could say you shouldn't do that. There's several different layers of things that you shouldn't do, but I don't know. I think as long as you point out the dangers of it, I, you know, I don't want to be dishonest with the listeners. So that's a tricky one. It's a tricky one, Kara. I don't know what to say. My my buddy Chase was asking me the other day, what's the safest number, what's the perfect group size to paddle with? Like in terms of just performance and safety, like what's the right number? Four. That's what I say, four. I say four to six. 
Six is too many. I think I think just, too slow. as long as you can fit him in one car on the shuttle, I think it's I think it's all good. What's the uh, what's the best way to rescue somebody? I mean, period. Just grab him. Grab that bitch. Yeah. Right. That's hands down. Yeah. So the thing is, if you have four people that know each other well enough to risk their lives to rescue one of their buddies in danger, you're in a pretty safe group. But for that to work, someone has to be willing to risk their life. You know what I mean? If someone's really stuck, because a lot of times you're looking at someone's, you know, you're looking at a situation. You're like, if I jump in there to help that person, I, I'm putting my own life at risk for sure. You know. I right. Hear you. I hear you. No, I'm with you. I'm Let me ask you. you another question. Since we're on the subject, because this has been troubling me, do you think there's an element in kayaking where kayakers are proud that we're in a sport where people drown regularly? Like that's an element of secret pride. I'd hope not. I certainly don't feel like that. Yeah, I don't either. I think if you are, you haven't lost somebody close to you yet. I don't, I don't know quite how to answer that one. Do you think that, John? I think I could see like a, an eight-year-old kid, you know, being a little proud that he's in a sport. Where, you know, he's bragging to his friends how people drown to doing what he does. Huh. But I think that's a that's a youthful error. Yeah. Well, I guess. Uh, sorry, Kara. You're right, Peter. And I think that I will just make sure that it's noted if I a question like that comes up, that it's noted that there is serious significant risk. And here's an example of why you shouldn't do it. Well, she's a she's a mom and she's my wife and she's coming from a place where why would you do something so selfish as to put your life unnecessarily at risk? Why would you do something that's selfish? I totally understand. Uh, I, and I think that's that's a very legitimate question to be well, asking. I think that, and I think that she just thought that we were downplaying the risks, which is fair. You know, I mean, Kara's totally right. That's just we're doing it anyway. <clears throat> OK, so I am getting ready to bring on Kevin Colburn, who are we going to do? Are we going to do the voicemails later on or are we going to how are you going to play that? Um, I think we got to do. I, think, I do want to get a plug in for next week's show, and I know one of our voicemails relates to that. I think we have time. I, I just I just right. uh, contacted Kevin, so let's do some voicemails, and then we'll and then we'll move away from all of the listener mail here. We can do Kevin first. I don't know. It's up to you, man. Nah, let's go ahead and let's go ahead. I think Kevin. I think Kevin is okay. We got some great voicemails. Sam uh, Sam Swanson calls in. He wants to get Billy Jones on the show. He is truly the grandfather of Jaw. Um, so we'll have to do that at some point. Um, a- Anonymous wants the uh, old schoolers. He wants us to get some of the uh, Rob Lessers and, and that like on the show. Uh, I think that's a good wintertime topic when there's not much so much going on. We'll get to that. We did get invited on the Grand Canyon. Well, some of us got invited to the Grand Canyon. Yeah, well, <laughs> you, you, Let's just make that clear. You know what? Let's listen to this one. Let's that just opened up on our August 18th Grand Canyon private trip and I, I would love to go with any one of you guys we, have, we only have one spot but I want to see if any of you want to go even John Wells I would begrudgingly accept <laughs> if, if either of you if either of you, of the other you want to go that would be better but uh, John if necessary I guess yeah that, I guess that, I guess that's all right uh, do you want to go? Nine one seven eight five six. Oh, oh, I don't want to put. <laughs> I don't want to put his phone number on the show. But can you, can you imagine if I showed up and they'd be like, someone took a shit in their dry bag. They're like, <laughs> oh man. Uh, so anyway, anyway, we got our first Grand Canyon invite. Yeah, I'm. Yeah, I'm gonna. Yeah, definitely, I'm gonna sign up for that. <laughs> one more time and another call in. I just want to ask you how uh, you feel no. about trespassing, uh, both on and off the water, you know. Um, and do you guys know the, uh, like, the rules in different states for uh, what's legal and what isn't for kayaking when you're on the water or if you're walking to and from the river? Uh, I'm just curious how you guys handle that and, uh, and uh, what you do about it. Thanks. Okay. So Canadian Joe Pesci... Oh. Although he has a weird voice, I'll tell you what, he comes through with some bangers. I mean, what do you think about, you know, private land and kayaking? I will tell you something about Mom Pants, <laughs> who's chiding us about, about uh, 
about solo boating. She loves trespassing as much as anything. That is like her favorite. You put a no trespassing sign up, she is instantly intrigued. (laughs) (laughs) And she has taken our kids deep, deep into private property that is heavily posted. (laughs) So, I don't know. Personally, I feel like when I'm on the river, I mean, maybe it's a sense of entitlement or whatever, but I feel like I can go anywhere that I want. I feel like that. What's the law? What's the law? People are always like, yeah, you can put on Cheeseman as long as you don't touch the ground. You won't get arrested. Is that true? Is that false? Is that fake news? What's the What's the deal here? I just, I, I don't know, but I just always Counselor? 100% feel like I can go paddling anywhere that I want. Lewis, tell me different. Um, that's my attitude as well. But uh, if you actually want to avail yourself of some better knowledge on that, uh, AW has this resource called the Navigability Toolkit, I believe. And for some reason, it's not linked from the front of the AW website. But if you Google American Whitewater Navigability Toolkit, you'll find it. And it has the state right to float laws for everywhere you'd want to go kayaking, you know, explaining that there's a lot of ambiguity out there. But if you want to be able to express righteous indignation at landowners and sheriffs and whatnot I, I suggest that as a resource okay everybody's all about trespassing okay here's our final voicemail we're going to be able to get to today because we got to get onto kevin colburn he has a victory lap that we is going to be cool this is a good question and this kind of leads into what we're going to be doing with the next show so here we go this comes at us from utah hi hammer factor this is now and friend calling in from utah thanks for the great show as always especially for Lewis's policy updates, and a lot of people give you shit about that, but I enjoy and learn a lot from them. <laughs> I have two questions for you. Number one, what are your thoughts on earplugs and preventing, you know, surfers ear kayaking ear? And then second, are you going to get the new round of Zinky Sup shirts in anytime soon? I have an email from John Grace saying they'd be in by the end of May, and I've been checking the website excitedly since then. So no luck. So thanks, boys. Have a great day. Okay. Well, a great question and uh, something uh, that I've been interested in. Kara, my wife, she has surfer's ear really bad. Anyway, long story short, I tracked down a guy named Dr. Hetzler, who is in Santa Cruz, I think, who is the, I think, from what I understand, one of the, if not the leading expert in surfer's ear surgeries in the United States that has done a bunch of whitewater kayakers. And we're, he's going to be on the show next week to explain all about it. So really excited about that. Super excited. I have a funny story about this. Me and uh, so there was a guy named Ryan Moore. who used to be a Potomac paddler and he was mm-hmm. in med school at the time, maybe like 15 years ago. And he was going around to river festivals and looking in the ears of kayakers and doing a little, yep. I remember that. a little survey. And this is actually the first time I met Grace, I believe was at Potomac festival this year. And John Grace and I tied for, Worst years at Potomac Fest. I remember I, that. I won, a, I won a free pair of flip flops. It's great. <laughs> yeah. And since then, I've started wearing earplugs at least sporadically, and it seems to have staved off surgery at least for a while. There you go. I, I, you know, I think that you had combined both of your ears worse, but my left ear. You know, like I was like 60% and like 95% and you were like 80% on both. It was tight. I know it was tight. I was. I, yeah. I remember it being like 90 to 95 close in both ears. Ugh. But like what they say is that you can hear pretty darn well until it actually fully closes and then you can't hear anything. Yeah. But I definitely notice it. I definitely notice hearing loss, like when there's like a lot of background noise, especially. Dude, that's the worst is when you're like in a bar or some kind of social venue and everybody's like looking at you and you can see their mouth moving, but you can't like place their sound. You just do a like smile and nod because you can only ask somebody (laughs) to repeat themselves so many times. How are your ears weld? I I had the same thing in crowds where I can't hear people very well anymore, but I I don't know if it's because I'm just old or what's going on. All right. Well, let's see if we can get Mr. Colburn on. Mr. Colburn is a Southeast Regional Director for the American Whitewater Association. There he is. Welcome back to the Hammer Factor, Kevin. He's the National Policy Director. Yes, 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 yes. So, Kevin, there's some hot news going on with Wild and Scenic. Yes. What's going on? Well, I think today, probably, we've passed the uh, 
first piece of wild and scenic legislation in Montana since 1976. Uh, and we passed the East Rosebud Wild and Scenic Rivers Act. And uh, it went through the Senate and the House, um, Senate in December, and then the House uh, this summer, and then again through the Senate, had to make another lap, and went to the president's desk last week. And by all accounts, the president should have signed it today or will do so very soon. That, Congrats, man. That is Thank incredible. You. So when did this process start and how did you actually get it done? Well, what is it? I don't even know what this is. Okay. Yeah, good question. So up in the Beartooth Mountains in Montana, there's a creek called East Rosebud. And there is a 20-mile section of it that we started looking at in uh, 2009, 2010 as a candidate for permanent protection. And we were looking at a whole bunch of rivers in Montana and still are. So it's it's a state that has just absolutely incredible rivers, but only um, only four wild and scenic rivers. So while Utah and Wyoming and Idaho and all these other nearby states have designated significant new wild and scenic rivers, Montana hadn't. So we were trying to trying to work on that. And then in 2009, somebody came in and proposed a, a hydropower dam on East Rosebud, and it just lit the, the locals and really everybody up, and it moved East Rosebud bud to the front of the line. So there's nothing like a threat to just really galvanize support for long-term conservation. So yeah, so really since like 2010, probably, we've been working on uh, designating East Rosebud as a wild and scenic river. And it, it takes a decade, you know, a lot of times, like eight or 10 years. It's, we often joke it's a marathon, not a sprint. And have you been working on this since the start, Kevin? Yep. Yeah, I actually uh, filed oppositions to the hydropower dam because it's kind of right in AW's wheelhouse, right? Fighting dams. It's like it's one of the things we're pretty good at. So um, I fought that dam and met a bunch of people and um, been working on Wild and Scenic since then. So why is this happening now? It seems like with Congress the way it is, that just would, this would be ejected out of hand without even looking at it? Yeah, that's a great question. I mean, you know, whenever you start a conservation bill like this or an effort, you're not going to finish with the same delegation you start with, right? They take years. So if you wait for like the people you think are the perfect people or most likely to pass a bill, you'll you'll lose them in two years or four years or six years. So um, you know, it, it happened now because it's just more and more popular. It's been around a long time. Uh, there's been a lot of pressure put on the delegation. And, you know, they're all receptive. We have a, you know, Republican congressman, Gene Forte. We have a, a, and then a mixed Senate, you know, with Senator Daines, Republican, and uh, Tester, who's a Democrat. And they've all been receptive. It's a nonpartisan issue. Like, we've managed to kind of just really highlight through communications and polling and talking to people and just meeting people. And, and uh, yeah, we just managed to cut through the partisan crap. And like, it's just popular. doesn't matter whether you're Republican or Democrat, you don't want to dam on East Rosebud Creek. And people were loud and clear about it. That is so rad. It's cool. It's like a model for how it's supposed to work, right? Like local people want something. They talk to their delegation. The delegation kind of does the math and says, yeah, it's, it's a good idea. And they do it. So what are the takeaways? For instance, like the work and things that are that we're doing on the Nolichucky and other places that you and, and, and some of your friends at AW are working on, what's the what's what what put this one over the edge? What what made it happen? I think um, you know, the old saying, all politics are local. So I think you've got to have a really good local ground game. And East Rosebud had this really strong group of, of local citizens that were just all about it. And they talked to their neighbors and their neighbors talked to their neighbors and they got pretty much um, unified support locally. And then they got the, and we worked on this too, to get the uh, all the newspapers behind it. You know, the press really matters to political decisions. So you had politicians around it, you had local groups around it, you had regional and national groups. Um, so kind of like hitting on all cylinders, all levels and uh, not falling into partisan traps. You know, you got to work with, Everybody, you got to work with, with whoever's in Congress that's representing your district. And I just don't think it really matters so much what party they're in. So with the Nilichucky, 
it would be an all Republican bill. And that's, that's great. It's totally possible. And this is a great example. We can point to this and say, look, you know, your colleagues out in Montana did this and uh, they got a lot of kudos for it. It's a really popular thing. Um, so I think that's, that's a big part of it. Um, recognizing that it takes time <laughs> is part of it and just, you know, keeping steady pressure over, over the long haul. Um, I mean, I guess the, what's crazy for me is like, I've, given up thinking there's such a thing as Republican and Democrats anymore. To me, it's just people that there's sort of constructive and destructive people. And the destructive mm -hmm. people just want to tear everything apart. It doesn't matter what it is or what the cause is or what it's about. And it just, I've, I've just gotten used to the idea that if someone's trying to make a wild and scenic area, that there's going to be a group of people that are just going to want to dest destroy that idea, period. Because it stands, you know, that's just what their, their role is now in this, in this country. You, uh, you don't notice that, that those particular it, people are congregated in one political party? Sure, but well, this is, this, is based on, <laughs> this is based on Steve Jobs' observation, you know, that the axis is no longer Republican and Democrat. It's constructive and destructive. You know what I mean? But this is, shows that there's some still sense of, of like, you know, responsible Republican Party people out there, you know? I think that's right. And I think that you, you just, you know, you have to you almost not have to care like why people want to do something for you politically. Like you just need to make it popular. You need to make it good for everyone and good for them. And like, and not, not go too deep. <laughs> I'll <laughs> agree like, with that. For motivations and, um, you know, it, it should work for everybody. Like that's part of what I do for hydro work, right? Like you got to make it work for everybody. You, you can't create winners and losers. And it's the same goes in politics, I think. Cause if you do, if you kind of create a like party war or a, any kind of battle, it just isn't going to happen. Obviously, so. American Whitewater had a big impact in this. Who were some other players you want to give a shout out to? Other organizations or local groups or anybody else who, who had a big hand in this? Oh, totally. Yeah. Uh, well, Friends of East Rosebud, that's the local group, and they're, they're super cool. Um, and then American Rivers has done an awesome job. They've got two staff, Mike Fibig and Scott Bossy, that are in Bozeman, and then Cassie Heron in Missoula. Uh, they did a lot of great groundwork on this. And uh, Greater Yellowstone Coalition also has staff in Bozeman who worked really hard on this. So I think those are kind of the, the number one, kind of like the top groups. But we have a coalition called Montanans for Healthy Rivers. It's uh, healthyriversmt.org. And uh, there's some other groups in that, like Pacific Rivers Council. And uh, there's been a, a backcountry hunters, sorry, backcountry hunters and anglers are in that group now. And uh, We've been working together just really well on this. And, you know, hopefully this is a stepping stone, kind of a proof of concept that like, yeah, Montana can pass a wild and scenic bill and hopefully we'll put together something bigger next year. You know, a bunch more streams. Congratulations, dude. Yeah, that's Thank great. you. Yeah, yeah that's it's pretty cool. It's, uh, you know, I've worked on a lot of wild and scenic stuff and this is the first river I will have actually like kind of seen through to designation. So it's really cool. <laughs> <laughs> nice, man. That was cool. Do you want to maybe just give us like like a two minute version of the Wild and Scenic Rivers Act and what it means when a river is designated Wild and Scenic? Yes, it means you can never dam that river. No one can ever dam that river for perpetuity. It's the number one thing. And then beyond that, it means that whatever makes the river really special, the managing agency has to keep it special. So if it's got really outstanding geologic values or recreation values or scenery the agency can't do anything to mess that up. Um, and then the agency, in this case, it's the Forest Service, has to create a river management plan that basically is a kind of a contract with the public to that says they'll never screw up the river. That's it. But it, it's, it's the tool to fight dams. There's nothing else that you can do that is so effective at preventing future dams. And this is a great act because it doesn't necessarily, and we've talked about this, is that it doesn't necessarily change the way things are. There's no like right. new burdens put on or things like that. It's essentially just making sure it stays the way it is. That's right. Yeah. Protect and enhance. So things can get better, but they can't get worse. Um, so so I, I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to pivot here, guys. Tell me you know, if I – if I go way off course here, and you probably can't chime in on this, Kevin, but can we just like <laughs> – do some shaming to all the Hammer Factor listeners out there who aren't AW members. I mean, thank you. 
Dude, can I just get in to how lame it is? I mean, just here in the southeast, I mean, you got like the Chioa, you got the West Fork of the Tuck, you got the Tallulah, you got all of these runs. You've got Wild and Scenic on the Rosebud. You've got all the things you're doing there, the work you've done on the green, and no one gets a damn membership. It's just like the dumbest thing ever. It's like the best money that you can spend as a kayaker. As far as I'm concerned, if you buy a kayak or a paddle or a dry top, it should be mandatory. You should not be able to make the purchase unless you're an AW member. Well, here's what we can do, and this is an extension of something I've been sort of talking get about. Get an AW, years. get an AW no, membership. That, and we have, I know a bunch of people from the industry listen to this show. If you want a pro deal from a kayaking manufacturer, kayak gear company, you should provide your AW number when you apply for that pro, when you get that pro deal. If you do not have an AW number, then that pro deal goes right back to you. Seriously, dude, I right? hear all That's the, the time. That's the new policy in the in the kayaking industry. I, I agree Love with it. that. I mean, I like it. <laughs> All right, let's make it happen. Well, thanks, John. I mean, what do you think? And in, in, in paddlers, members, what do you guys got? 3,000 members, something like that? We got, we got around six. You got 6,000 6, members. 000. All right, so yeah. by the end of this show, we're, we should add another 4,000. So we should be at 10,000 by the end of this show. And I think that's like a good operating number. I, I like it. Wow. Can I say one more thing, too? That AW, and Lewis works with us a lot on this stuff, but when we post action alerts, it's completely there's completely no BS. So like if we're posting an action alert with like send your congressman something, it's really important. So we love when folks will do that. So in addition to, to joining and supporting our organization, which we deeply value and need, um, you know, pay attention to what we're asking folks to do because we're, we're pretty targeted about it. Yeah, yeah, totally. I mean, I think Outdoor Alliance and American Whitewater and, you know, all the other organizations we work with, like, we are all acutely aware that if we pummel you with emails to do things that don't matter, you're going to start ignoring them. So when we ask for something like we mean it, (laughs) please help if you can. Right. I mean, with so Coco Tet NRS, I'll just, I've been mulling this over. Coco Tet NRS, if you guys are out there, send me an email. And if we, all three of us make it so that you have to have an AW membership to get a pro deal, then we can all do it. Because if one of us does it, everyone's going to go over to the other guy and try the pro deal over there. All right. At Green River Access Fund, if you don't have a key to the lock, you can't get in and do it. You know what I mean? But, like, you can still go to the Chio, You can still go to the Tallula. You can still go to these areas without an AW membership. It just needs to be understood that the whole reason you can go there. It's like being in the union. It's like if you're not paying your dues, you're freeloading. <laughs> you're freeloading. Exactly. You're freeloading. And it's, and it's insane how many people – do this. I mean, what's it cost a year? 30 bucks, 40 bucks. I don't even know. I just like 35 bucks, 35 yeah. bucks. Okay. Yeah. So, uh, well, okay. You didn't say that. Yeah. That's oh. actually <laughs> <steep>. <laughs> anyway, I'm backpedaling this one a little bit. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. Maybe, can, can we get a pro deal on that? <laughs> <laughs> nice guy. <laughs> uh, Anyway, congratulations. That's rad. Thank you very much. You can stick around for rants and raves. Yeah. Do you have a to a rave? Uh, I got a rave. All right. It better not be softball. This better be good. Yeah. This is pretty softball. <laughs> AW has a new app, and it's really cool. And volunteers made it. So I want to rave about our volunteers that made the new app. And uh, folks should check it out. I just drove across country, um, which is a long drive. And uh, I was able to like stop in towns and pop open the app and be like, oh, like here's what's running that's right by me right now. And like just refresh it as I went. And I've never been able to do that before with the AW site. So that was kind of cool. I just think that like people that are really creative and smart and make things like that are amazing. And this is available like on the app store, like the iTunes app store. iOS and Android and it's free. There you go. I just downloaded it yesterday. And? So far, so good. Okay. Is there a gauge for the little light, by the way? <laughs> There's not. You got to be in the know. <laughs> Am I going to be in the know? <laughs> you to come paddling with me? Is there a secret handshake or something? <laughs> Jaw treats. <laughs> That's me. <big. laughs> be out there in two weeks. Right, Kara's well, going to be an endless amount of crap for that name, by the way. For Jaw treats? <laughs> yeah. <laughs> All right, I got a rant. I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to jump into a rant here. And this is uh, something that I was talking to about a friend of mine the other day. It was brought up, and and, and since we were talking about it, it's become more and more apparent. As I'll follow all of these kayakers who are out doing these amazing things, I love just 
it's just like super entertaining for me. I love to see where they're going, what they're doing, the rivers they're checking out. But, and let me just assure you, as someone who spent a solid 15 years traveling, and I, it's way harder with a family, a family and everything to travel, like, and to all of the other kayakers out there who are dreaming of these faraway places, if you're on your social media and you're complaining, if you're in some awesome country in some faraway place and you start complaining about the coffee on social media or you start complaining about you know, the noise your car makes or how you had trouble with the racks on whatever you got or all of these weird things, it's an instant tune out. So this is also an rant and advice. Like if you're out there living the dream, don't complain about living the dream. Hmm. That's better than your typical fecal rants that you make. (laughs) 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 People pooping in bags or pooping in your yard. (laughs) (laughs) Who's next? Got? Uh, I'm going to jump off from our, our rapid naming conversation earlier, and I'm going to rant about like crass rapid names. Like my least favorite rapid name is "Show Me Your Tits" on Fantasy Falls. I hate that name. It is just like an abomination. It's like that rapid used to be called the thing, or it should be called the thing, and like you don't need to name rapid something just like horribly cringe worthy it's just like drives me nuts and on a related note the other trend in rapid naming that i really can't stand is naming rapids after the person who got hurt on that rapid like willie kern slide on dinky creek or the jed weingarten slide on fantasy it's like i feel like there's this like it's like it's not even like people don't even do it intentionally it's like that just becomes the like mental cue for remembering that rapid is like somebody who had something awful happen to them there you have, you have a problem with that it's kind of a bummer don't you think it's like really, he gets to the I top mean, of this rapid like the thing that just gets called to mind just like is like the one horrible thing that happened in that rapid yeah that's just n- human nature yeah i know it's kind of a bummer though I'm with you in the stupid rapid names. But I, you know, I kind of think like, I think the only person that should really get a say to to change the name is the first person who ran it. You know what I mean? Like, you can't come in later and be like, oh, I saw like a chick, somebody, then that's show me your tits. I don't, like, can you? But I feel like so often now it's like there's not really very much like actual naming of rapids. It's like names just sort of get attached to rapids. Like, it's like, oh, that rapid that Jed Petoned on, and then before you know it, everybody's just calling it the Jed Weingarten slide. You know? Interesting. I agree, though, with the crass names. It's it's pretty cringeworthy for me when I have to, like, negotiate with power companies and, you know, <laughs> put, put the names on a map. You know, the Nana Halo, there's, some, there's a really bad one on White Oak Creek, and, oh... It's like it's where the project manager from the power company, it's where his grandmother and grandfather had a grist mill. And it's this like really cool spot. And it's gotten this just super foul name. <laughs> I was really hoping we would never have to have that conversation. What, what, what's the name? Uh, uh, can I say this? I don't think I can say this in the air. Well, it's wh- like, whisper it to me and I'll say it. <laughs> I'll just say it, it's. Uh, uh, you guys look it up. Do your research. <laughs> so, it's Becky's something, something and boner. Becky had a, Becky's Becky had boner. A sexual experience. Yeah. Becky's boner. No. Oh. Okay. Well. Anyway, if you know that I Hammer Factor listeners, for the guess, if you wanted to keep guessing, I'm sure. <laughs> I don't know, Lewis. What about like Graceland, the big slide on the West Cherry that I named? That's a great name. That's okay. If you if you run it first, I think you you have the right to name it. Right, that's a great name. How do you guys feel about renaming rapids that already have names given by normal people, like geographic names on maps, and you rename them with the kayaking cultural name? Is that is that bad? I don't think that's bad. You're talking about like Linville Falls or something like that. Yeah. So like, yeah, exactly. Like something has a name like Peterson's Falls or something from somebody who named it 200 years ago and you come in and rename it, you know, like best booth ever. 
know. Best poop ever does have a nice ring to it. Yeah. I mean, you have yeah. to say. Actually, I kind of <laughs> like that. Yeah. I don't know. I'm a, I'm a traditionalist like that. All right. My rant is going to be beautiful and simplicity. <clears throat> uh, product designers, outdoor gear product designers, attention. We no longer need bottle openers on our outdoor gear, period. <laughs> that can now stop. <laughs> we don't need bottle openers in our bike pumps. We don't need bottle openers in our spatulas. We don't need bottle openers in our flip-flops. We don't need bottle openers on literally every single flashlight. Every single thing you get now has a bottle opener on it. You can stop. We have enough. We and we have canned enough. beer. And we have canned beer. Thank Which you. is what you should be taking out in the outdoors anyway. Right. That's it. All right. Well, thanks for coming on, Kevin. And uh, Absolutely. once again... Thanks for everything that you do at AW, and uh, I guess that pretty much sums it up for 